Kevin Van Hooser is Research Professor of Systematic Theology here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He's the author or editor, editor of over two dozen books, uh, the most recent of which, Biblical Authority After, but that is the most recent, right? Okay, two dozen books, the most recent of which, Biblical Authority After Babel, Retrieving the Solas in the Spirit of Mere Protestant Christianity, is both a response to criticisms of Protestant biblical interpretation and a call for renewal through reappropriation of the five solas of the Reformation. His two dramatic volumes, The Drama of Doctrine uh, and uh, Faith Speaking Understanding Performing the Drama of Doctrine, uh, were both awarded Christianity Today's Best Theology Book of the Year. And today's lecture is entitled T.F. Torrance's Cataphysical Poetics, How the Incarnation Relates Theological Science to Scientific Theology in the Doctrine of Creation with special reference to general relativity. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Kevin Van Hooser. back down when the topic is reality. I believe that, I've said it, but T.F. Torrance, whose dates are 1913 to 2007, made it the lodestar of his career, going the second mile, often at the speed of light, to bring theology and the physical sciences into a mutually edifying conversation. In defending theological realism, appropriating Einstein, and refusing to cede the rubric science to the natural sciences, Tom Torrance was both prophet to modernity and apostle to the physicists. What do patristic theologians have to do with modern physics? Ancient Alexandria seems at first glance light years removed from Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. But to understand why it is not is to begin to understand Torrance's unique contribution to the theology science dialogue. The most important thing to grasp about Torrance is his understanding of science as the disciplined way in which we come to know a particular object. The subject matter in question defines the methods for coming to know it. The means to understanding must accord with the substance of what is sought. In brief, ontology determines epistemology. That's Torrance's fundamental axiom, as it was uh, for John Philoponus of ancient Alexandria, Karl Barth, and, according to Torrance, Albert Einstein. Let me introduce a shorthand term for this axiom, cataphysics. Unlike metaphysics, which Torrance thinks is often speculative and a priori, starting with first principles from which science is then deduced, real science for Torrance is katafusin, cataphysics, according to the nature of the object, and hence a posteriori. Torrance sees a deep cataphysical connection between theologically, theological science, that is, theologically influenced science, and scientific theology, scientifically influenced theology. Theology and science stand in a positive, not antagonistic, relation, because each is interested in the natural world, and each contributes something to the other. And most importantly, each is scientific in its own way. Torrance takes from Karl Barth the idea that the proper object of Christian theology is the triune God in self-communication. And he views the incarnation as the ground of our deepest insights into the natural world, too. Torrance is widely recognized as the greatest theologian of Brit Britain's greatest generation. In 1978, he received the Templeton Foundation Prize for Progress in Religion for his contributions to the dialogue between theology and science. Now, how did a person responsible for translating Barth's church dogmatics into English come to be interested in the natural sciences, particularly given Barth's own antipathy to the project of natural theology, and as we heard today, his ambivalence towards science? There is an answer, but to appreciate it involves baptism by immersion, not sprinkling, which is a fitting move because that indicates the way Torrance thinks we come to know things in general, less by ratiocination than by 
hold-in personal participation. So my intent now is to aid our indwelling of, hopefully not drowning in, the deep end of Torrance's theological pool. It's an intimidating prospect. Uh, George Hunsinger teaches us how to read Karl Barth in 300 pages, but Elmer Collier's How to Read T.F. Torrance is 100 page longer. So as I say, these are deep waters. And I'm now at section two on the outline you should have. Fortunately, Torrance is something of a narrative theologian. He has a story to tell. It's a grand narrative about Western intellectual history and ranges over developments in science, philosophy, and theology alike. Paul Molnar quips that Torrance can summarize a thousand years of thought in one paragraph. I need six or seven. But it's a story that Torrance tells which begins with his study of patristic theology, from which he learned that knowledge in any field is governed by the nature of the object. And the story Torrance tells, and he tells it in many places over many books, it's basically a set of variations on what I'm calling a cataphysical theme, this fundamental axiom that the object to be known dictates the way we come to know it. Torrance's story is about poetics, we might say, the study of the ways in which thinking, experiencing, and being either relate to one another or fail to relate. Now, Torrance doesn't use the term poetics himself, Yet he unfailingly calls our attention to the importance of how the forms that inhere in reality relate to forms of human thinking and forms of human experiencing. Consider the example of two mathematical poetics. The Man Who Knew Infinity is the story of Srinivasa Ramanukan, a self-taught Indian mathematician who went to Cambridge University to work with the Englishman Professor G. H. Hardy. Now, Ramanukan was a devout Hindu for whom mathematical discovery was more like a mystical vision than long division. He claimed that the discoveries, and there were many that he made, the discoveries he made were like revelation. He famously said, an equation to me has no meaning unless it expresses a thought of God. But by contrast, his Cambridge mentor insisted on a step-by-step -step demonstration of how he got from here to there. Professor Hardy has been called the apostle, proof, apostle of proof to Ramanujan's Prince of Intuition. Well, Torrance belongs in the latter royal lineage, Prince of Intuition. Now, every good story has a villain, and for Torrance, that role is played by dualism. Dualism in its various guises, epistemological, ontological, and theological. Because dualism contradicts Torres's fundamental axiom. Dualism challenges the unitary nature of reality. It severs the correspondence between the way things are and the way we experience and know them. Three examples must suffice. First, the father of modern philosophy, René Descartes, a purveyor of two dualisms. Uh, the first, Cartesian dualism, the idea that the material body and the immaterial mind are two completely different kinds of substance. We know about Cartesian dualism, but it's as old as Plato. I'm going to turn next to the father of modern physics, Isaac Newton, who understood space and time dualistically, Torrance says. Newton viewed space as a container independent of what takes place in it namely the interaction of material particles in motion. Space is absolute. It's a universal frame of reference in light of which discrete particles can be plotted with the timeless and universal principles of Euclidean geometry. So Newton conceived a physical reality as a mechanical universe whose every motion from falling apples to orbiting planets is susceptible to mathematical formulation. And his achievement generated significant problems, both for physics and theology. In the first place, Newton never explained what gravity was. But the theological serious problem was that Newton's view of the universe as particles in a box that move according to fixed mathematical laws leaves little room for God to act, much less to enter. <laughs> 
The third dualist Torrance repeatedly uh, mentions is Immanuel Kant. Kant, as you know, set out to rescue Newton's physics from David Hume's criticism that while we do experience one event after the other, we never experience the relation of causality itself. But Kant proposed an entirely new way of thinking about the relations of forms of experiencing and forms of thinking, a Copernican poetics. Because space and time for Kant are not things we experience, they're conditions for experience. And causality is not a form of experience, but a form of thinking about experience supplied by the human mind. What we know and what Newton's laws of motion describe are not things in themselves, but how things in space and time appear to us when processed by the categories of the mind. In other words, science gives us knowledge of phenomena, appearances only, not the way things really are. And Kant, for Torrance, represents the epitome of the modern mind, a mind that operates with a poetics partly of invention, imposing forms of intelligibility onto experience, rather than a poetics of discovery that perceives the intrinsic intelligibility of nature. Now, the social and individual constructivisms associated with postmodernity, these are simply radicalizations of Kant's poetics. And as to theology, Kant's poetics give rise to a whole series of ugly ditches that reflect the underlying dualism of what is knowable and what is not. For the modern mind, riddled with dualism, the incarnation is literally unthinkable. The space-time history of Jesus Christ cannot be a revelation of the very God. What Torrance most regrets about the modern mind, though, is the tendency to dissociate science from theology. Now, moving on to point C, Torrance's story also has heroes, all foes of ancient and modern dualisms. The holistic, cataphysical poetics that these figures champion enabled Torrance to affirm both theological science and scientific theology. Pride of place in Torrance's roll call of cataphysical faith goes to Karl Barth. It was Barth who said, let my people, the church, go to the pharaoh of modern scientific method. He was the one who said the scientific status of an inquiry is determined primarily by the subject matter. We let the nature of what we know determine for us the form of our knowledge. So Bart helped Torrance appreciate theology as a distinct science with its own distinct object, God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ. And Bart exposited this self-communication in Trinitarian terms. God, the Father, reveals himself, the Son, through himself, the Spirit. And this also dispatches another fateful dualism, that is, between the way God appears in Jesus Christ and the way God is in himself. So at the heart of Barth's cataphysical poetics stand the doctrines of the hypostatic union and the consubstantial communion of the persons of the Holy Trinity. In short, homoousios and perichoresis, terms that recall Nicene theology. Torrance's tireless advocacy of Nicaea makes him perhaps one of the first ressourcement theologians. And he wants to retrieve both the theology and the science of ancient Alexandria. He insists that the Greek fathers were aware of science's cataphysical nature, namely that knowledge depends on rightly grasping the inherent nature of whatever is being investigated. And according to Torrance, no one grasped this better than Athanasius. His insistence on homoousios, that the Son has the same nature as God, is the guarantee that God has indeed communicated within the structures of space-time existence, not simply his appearance, but his reality. Quote, what Athanasius did was to think through and set out on a scientific basis the church's knowledge of the Father and the Son in their mutual relations. And at the same time, 
to think through and work out the biblical account of the economic condescension of the son in the form of a servant. End quote. So this is how Athanasius assimilated the scientific method that had been developed in Alexandria, what I'm calling cataphysics, and the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity, says Torrance, is nothing less than the proper outcome of scientific engagement with the reality of God disclosed in Jesus Christ. Homo homoousios is shorthand for the insight then that it's in Christ that the objective reality of God is linked with physical and creaturely forms of experience and thought. Alexandria was also home to the 6th century physicist and theologian John Philoponus, whom Torrance credits with helping him discern, quote, the powerful heuristic impact of Christian theology upon the foundations and advance of natural science, physics in particular. It was the Alexandrian teaching about the word of God and creation in the beginning that led Philoponus to criticize Aristotle's assumption about the eternality of matter, that God created light and endowed it with distinct force, also led Philoponus to criticize Aristotle's static notion of light, and Torrance says he thereby anticipated 20th century physics. Torrance says, Philoponus realized that Aristotelian logic applied only to static relations of idealized forms, as in Euclidean geometry, not to real intelligible relations in the actual dynamic world of space and time. So Philoponus's theology influenced his science, and his science returned the favor by encouraging him to deepen his understanding of God's dynamic reality. Torrance thinks Philoponus anticipated both Einstein and Karl Barth. Now, two modern heroes in Torrance's honor roll of cataphysics. James Clerk Maxwell discovered the speed of light and rejected Newton's mechanical model of the universe, replacing it with something more fluid and relational. Torrance suggests that it was Maxwell's faith, particularly his sense of being in union with Christ, that allowed him to gain an intuitive appreciation of the relation of God to his creation and eventually a feel for the relations inherent in nature itself. It called for a kind of holistic thinking in which, Torrance says, real dynamic relations have their full value without being mauled by abstract Aristotelian logic or flattened by Euclidean geometric pa patterns. You see, Maxwell could not explain the behavior of electricity and magnetism or light in Newton's mechanistic terms. His intuition was that particles are related not merely externally, but internally. That is, they're interconnected within dynamic fields of force where there are interrelations between the particles are part of what they are. In other words, the relationship between particles, Maxwell saw, are an intrinsic part of what they are. And he became convinced as a scientist that relation is the most important thing to know. And Torrance finds an impressive parallel with Nicaea's emphasis on the interrelations, or what he calls ontorelations, between the persons of the Trinity. Albert Einstein provides Torrance with his most important cataphysical 20th century thinker. In fact, you might say if Einstein did not exist, Torrance would have to invent him or someone like him. Einstein overturned Newton's dualism of space and matter. He objected to the imposition of Euclidean forms onto physical reality, which he viewed not as externally related particles, but as elements in a continuous spatio-temporal field. Torrance says, Euclidean geometry is suitable for flat spaces, but not for curved ones. Einstein's genius, he thinks, was to call for a new kind of geometry that would be truly cataphysical, that is, in accordance with the nature of physical reality, understood now not in terms of independent bits of matter and motion, in a spatial vacuum, 
but rather in terms of space-time gravitational fields. Now, Einstein derived his theory of relativity not from prior ideas or from sense observations, but from an imaginative, imaginative insight into the objective intelligibility of the universe. He gained knowledge of an inherent relatedness that characterizes the universe, independently of our perceiving or conceiving of it. And Torrance calls this insight of Einstein the homoousion of physics. The basic insight that our knowledge of the universe is not limited to appearances or what we can deduce from appearances, but is a grasping of reality in this ontological depth, the homoousion of physics. Torrance considers Einstein a realist, one who holds that the simplest explanation of what makes theories work is that they relate to the way things really are. But here things get tricky. While Torrance believes that Einstein's theory corresponds to the way things are, he also thinks that there's no logical bridge that allows us to move from experience to concept directly. On the contrary, it's the invisible things like gravitational forces that explain the visible, the movement of planets. The wonder of science is the openness of the structure of the universe to our rational investigation and the openness of our knowing to the intelligible nature of the universe. Leibniz calls that pre-established harmony, the pre-established harmony between mind and world. Einstein put it this way. He says, the world of our sense experience is comprehensible. That the fact that it is comprehensible is a miracle. Theologians, start your engines. So how did Einstein come up with his theory of relativity if it isn't by induction or deduction? Remember that in cataphysical science, the object of, inqu uh, the object of inquiry directs the inquiry. Well, Torrance so says that the physical universe disclosed itself to Einstein's mind. And if that seems far-fetched, remember my the other person who knew infinity, Ramanujan, and his claim that mathematical equations express God's thoughts. Torrance believes that natural science relies on intuition, namely the sheer weight or impress of external reality upon a person's openness or apprehension. Some might call it revelation. In fact, in a stunning allusion to Moses in Exodus 33, Torrance says this, nature manifests itself to us and even discloses to us objective structures that are inherently non-observable, but constitute, so to speak, the invariant backside of reality. Section three. To this point, we've seen how Torrance views both the natural sciences and theology as cataphysical, attempts to think their respective objects according to their respective natures. And yet, both theology and the natural sciences have an interest in the natural world. So how does Torrance negotiate this potential conflict of interests? He seldom gets tied up in the specifics of debates about creation, about old or young earth, or about the length of the days. Instead, he focuses on the that and the what of the universe. That it did not have to be, and the order it happens to have. The contingency, coherence, and capacities of the created universe are ultimately explicable, he believes, only in light of Christology. Matter is not eternal, but the triune God is. God has always been Father, Son, and Spirit, but God has not always been maker of heaven and earth. The universe was not a necessary emanation of God's being. Rather, God in love and freedom decided to create the universe ex nihilo. The universe is neither self-starting, self-sustaining, or self-explanatory, but wholly dependent on God. And this is why Torrance thinks that science will never be able to provide a sufficient explanation as to why there is something rather than nothing. We learned that creation is contingent. Second, 
God's freedom in creating pertains not only to that he created, but to what he created. This is a second sense of contingency. Though creation has an integrity of its own, it could have been different. To say otherwise would be to compromise God's freedom in creating. So it's precisely because the order of the universe cannot be deduced necessarily from something like the idea of best possible world or any other a priori that we have to study it in all its particularity. In other words, not only the existence, but also the intelligibility of the universe is contingent. And Torrance believes that that insight provides natural science with its Magna Carta. At the same time, because all things were made through him, John 1, 3, the word who was in the beginning with God, Torrance views creation as inscribed with Christological coherence. By him all things were created, and in him all things hold together, Colossians 1. So the universe, says Torrance, is a cosmic unity due to the all-embracing and integrating activity of the divine logos, so that a single rational order pervades all created existence contingent upon the transcendent rationality of God. Now, this conviction that there is a single intelligible order to the universe entered the bloodstream of Western intellectual history thanks to the Nicene vision of creation ex nihilo. Though, Torrance says, various dualisms subsequently repressed it and slowed down the development of physical science for a millennium. Incarnation, he thinks, implies something else of great significance about the created order, namely that it's not closed in upon itself, but it's open for divine business. It's receptive to divine action. The homoousion explodes the container idea of space by telling us the sun shared our space while remaining very God. Torrance says space cannot contain the sun. He is the Lord of space. So he doesn't simply exist at a particular location. He occupies it. Space, he says, is here a predicate of the occupant determined by his agency. So theological science and scientific theology agree. Space is not a place where two entities collide. It's rather the ground of their interrelatedness, their field. And it is in Christ, says Torrance, that the objective reality of God is intelligibly linked with physical and creaturely forms of thought. Point C. In addition to the divine and contingent order, Tor Torrance also posits a contingent freedom of creation. Created entities have competence. That is, they're capable of acting according to their natures. They can be themselves. Yet Torrance insists, following scripture, that our world has fallen into disorder. This is where the homoousion comes into its own. Because all things were not only made through the Lagos, but all things will be healed and restored in him. Torrance affirms Gregory of Nazianzus' dictum that the unassumed is the unhealed. So the incarnation is not an interruption of the natural order, but the freely chosen way of God's rational love in the fulfillment of his eternal purpose for the universe. Section four. Torrance never backs down when reality is the topic, especially when he's talking to scientists. He's a realist, one who holds that humans can know the reality behind the surface physical appearances. In his view, there is no genuinely scientific thinking without this realist attitude that is, without cataphysics. And Torrance's cataphysical poetics posits this pre-established harmony between forms of being and forms of knowing and speaking, the way things are and the way we conceptually represent them. A harmony pre-established at creation ex nihilo through the Logos and actualized by the incarnation of the Logos. And it's to preserve the integrity of this pre-established harmony that Torrance keeps appealing to the homoousios to attack dualisms that divide what we can know, the appearances, from the way things are, reality. 
I welcome Torrance's emphasis on theological realism. I agree with his insistence that reality is multi-leveled and that each lower level is open to the level above. Still, I find myself wrestling with certain aspects of his thought. My first question concerns his revised natural theology and its relation to the natural theology of Thomas Aquinas and scholasticism in general. Is the Western scholastic tradition guilty of dualism, as Torrance's story of Western intellectual history sometimes suggests? Must Thomas Torrance doubt Thomas Aquinas? And what is Torrance's attitude towards natural theology? So I want to look at a series of Thomases here. We begin with the clearly anti homoousian Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, who, like Newton, was a dualist. I'm not thinking of church and state right now, but that too. He was a dualist who separated divine action and space. God is detached in a different region from the closed causal continuum that is the world and from what happens in it. So Jesus is not God in the flesh for the deist. At best, he's a moral philosopher. Jefferson alternately described himself as an Epicurean, 19th century materialist, a Unitarian, and famously, a sect by myself. More or less, everything Torrance opposes. So it's no surprising that he would doubt that Thomas. But more surprising is Torrance's suspicion of his medieval namesake, Saint Thomas, despite Aquinas' orthodoxy and affirmation of theology as a science. But Torrance associates Thomism with seeking to know God by studying nature. And what that does, he says, that it privileges the, not the father-son relationship, but the creator-creature relation. And the two are very different. The creator-creature relation leads inexorably to the immutable, omnipotent, and impassable God of Christian theism. To privilege the creator-creature relation over the father-son relation, eventually, he says, gives rise to the worst kind of dualism, a dualism that divides the essence of the one God from the onto relations of the three persons. And Torrance finds such a dualistic concept of God in the Summa, Theo Summa Theologica, insofar as the Trinity is a kind of appendix to an independently reached doctrine of the one God. Torrance is also reluctant to do either scientific theology or theological science from the bottom up, which is what he sees Aquinas doing following Aristotle. Scholasticism leads to a view of God that is analogous to nature, yes, but not to God's nature. We need the homoousion for that, he insists. Remember, the order of nature is contingent. One can't move from creation to creator by a logical or analogical bridge. To seek the knowledge of God elsewhere than the incarnation thus, says Torrance, is to contradict the Trinity and set aside the gospel. Uh, point three. It's because the universe is a free and contingent creation that Torrance rejects the kind of natural theology that reasons in this bottom-up manner from cre creature to creator. There's no necessary connection between the created order and creator such that one could draw straight lines from things in the universe to divine perfections. Uh, Torrance again makes this point by saying there's no logical bridge for moving between the created order and God. So far, perhaps, so Bart. But Torrance doesn't leave it there uh, with a contrast between natural and revealed theology. That might sound too dualistic. Rather, he wants to reform natural theology by relocating it within revealed theology, similar to the way that Einstein reformed Euclidean geometry by locating it within his relativity theory. So, do the heavens declare the glory of God? Torrance wants to say yes, but again, this is not something we can read off the surface of creation because there is no logical bridge between the world and God. Remember contingency. And yet there is a real and rational relation between what natural science can discover about creation 
and the creator who reveals himself in Jesus Christ. This reformed natural theology prompts for me three questions. First, though the created order is contingent, which again for Torrance means it could have been otherwise, I want to ask how much other how much otherwise could it have been? Take, for example, the human creature created in God's image. How much different could humans be and still be in the image of God? How much contingency is there in the creation of man? Similarly, the heavens declare the glory of God. Would any astronomical arrangement do? Or is there a divine grammar to which these celestial statements must conform? Second, do Einstein's concepts have a better purchase on ultimate reality than Aristotle's? Isn't this a matter of comparing apples, Newton's apples, physics, with oranges, metaphysics? Doesn't Aquinas do what good contextual realists always do? Namely, take the concepts available in his contemporary culture and try to use them to express biblical judgments. And he does go so far as amend Aristotle with regard to the eternality of matter. Matthew Levering is a present-day theologian who claims we still need Aquinas' metaphysical categories, rightly to interpret scripture. Steve Long may be another. There's also a book by Ger uh, Gerard Verschuren entitled Aquinas and Modern Science. And he argues about the necessity for Aquinas' metaphysics for doing justice to classical and quantum physics. But my point is this, nature is one, but could there be more than one conceptual scheme for knowing it? Does, a, does Torrance rightly distinguish physical from metaphysical categories? And this leads to my third question, and I think to the heart of his cataphysical poetics. And it's this, how do we know which concepts and theories rightly correspond to reality? Torrance insists that reality itself, or that reality reveals itself to those with eyes and ears to hear and see. Theories aren't simply conceptual projections from a creative mind onto inert matter. They're rather transparent disclosure models through which the truth of creation shines through. Torrance's realism maintains that the external world exerts pressure on our minds as it gives itself to be known. And that's how we can come up with an actual correspondence between the way things are and our thinking. This is what happens, says Torrance, if knowers are rightly attuned to what is being given. And that's a mighty if and mighty difficult to understand. But let me make a stab. Recall Einstein's imaginative insight into the surface of things, beyond the surface of things. His insight into their ontological depths, what Torrance called the homoousion of physics. Torrance turns to Michael Polanyi to help interpret such aha moments. There's a tacit dimension to knowing, a subsidiary awareness of background patterns in addition to focal obs observation. Empirical experimentation is not enough. You have to indwell a particular field of investigation in order to grasp its constitutive relations. For example, I only began to understand Tom Torrance after indwelling the body of his works, eating, drinking, sleeping Torrance for weeks. It was wonderful. <laughs> One author thinks the key to understanding Torrance is the idea of compulsion. Quote, Reality compels us to know it according to its true nature. Torrance is obsessive about this compulsion. Real things exert real force, but persons have to be open to the argument. Polanyi uses perceptual integration as a model. Consider a stereogram from one of the Magic Eye picture books. May I have that first slide? Now, no amount of detailed analysis of the surface features of the picture is going to help you see what's there. But perhaps we have an Einstein in the room who can see through the surface of things to the ontological depth. Does anybody see what that's a picture of? Would you believe me if I told you 
There are three monkeys, monkey, see no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil. Three monkeys with hands over their various sense organs. I assure you, I've seen it myself. Um, it works best when you don't try to focus, but just relax, and it's probably hard in this light, but if you just relax and let your eyes kind of go cross-eyed and blurry, somehow the brain integrates things that we are only subsidiarily aware of, and it comes into focus. So, uh, no amount of analysis uh, enables you to see the form that's hidden. You have to look at the whole, you can't focus on the details. Basically, the mind integrates the subsidiary clues to the matrix of these interrelations that constitute the three-dimensional whole. How do you know if you've seen the image correctly? Well, you'll know it when you see it. <laughs> or, you could have a key to the right answers. Second slide illustrates this. If you look at these patterns in the way that I've described, eventually you'll see a three-dimensional object that's pictured below. By the way, Torrance wants to say something similar about reading scripture. In lectures he gave at Fuller Theological Seminary, he criticized the way in which some exegetes operate with logical causal patterns of thought that given the subject matter, the Word of God, are unscientific because they get no further than the surface phenomena. They don't see the image that's hidden in the patterns. So Torrance says that exegetes should not simply parse terms or outline grammar. They should prayerfully indwell the text until they perceive its unitary truth, the living Word of God. Torrance calls this depth interpretation, and that's exactly what you need to see these images. Well, I think I get it, but I'm not entirely convinced. Maybe that means I don't get it, after all, that I don't see the pattern in Torrance's work. Or is there a room for legitimate disagreement and conversation? John Hick once told Torrance that he didn't get it after listening to a lecture, and an exasperated Torrance replied, you will never understand unless you repent. <laughs> so, who has to repent of practicing poor theological science? Arminians or Calvin, Calvinists? Federal Calvinists or Evangelical Calvinists? Conservative or progressive Evangelicals? <coughs> and no doubt the Lutherans would say all of the above. <laughs> but the point I'm making concerns the conflict of interpretations in theological science and scientific theology. How do you negotiate interpretive disagreement given cataphysical poetics? Why don't we all see the same thing? These are large questions. Torrance is familiar with them, and he's not without resources for responding. We can't go into this now, but one criterion he appeals to is Catholicity. And I think it's because he knew that this interpretive disagreement was such an issue that he spent so many years after his retirement in ecumenical discussions, particularly with Greek Orthodox figures uh, about the Trinity. My final point concerns the pastoral implications of adopting forms of living, thinking, and speaking that are in accord with scientific accounts of reality. Torrance rightly acknowledges that Scripture depicts God freely engaging the contingent order of nature. But Scripture doesn't describe the natural world the way Maxwell and Einstein do. And it's doubtful that Jesus had relativity in mind when, in explaining the parable of the sower, he stated, the field is the world. Maxwell would say the world is the field. So to what extent can God talk be coordinated with or take its cue from, say, quantum mechanics? Jesus does say, two men shall be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. But it's doubtful that he had Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle in mind. The salient point is that Jesus' parables, like much of scripture, focus on the mezzo level, somewhere in between the micro and macro levels. The mezzo level gives rise to middle distance realism, a concept I take from David Ford, who took it from the literary critic J.P. Stern. This realism straddles the middle 
between the quantum and the astronomical. The middle distance, says Ford, is that focus which best does justice to the ordinary world of people in interaction. Newton's laws still apply there. And while the salvation we have in Christ is cosmic in scope, Scripture focuses on how our new life in Christ gets worked out in ordinary situations with a middle distance realism. If you move either too close or stand too far away, you'll lose the storyline of Scripture. So how can we integrate the narrative form into our unified field theory? I'm sure Torrance would resonate with the concern to do justice to the level of the interpersonal. But the question with which I'm left is how to integrate narrative into a scientific theology. I think it's interesting that Torrance tends to dialogue with the natural sciences rather than the human sciences. By way of contrast, Paul Ricoeur argues that narrative is precisely the form, the literary and cognitive form, that best accords with human temporality, being in time. So perhaps it too should qualify as a bona fide cataphysical form. Conclusion. I began by saying that Christian theologians should never back down when the topic is reality. But how about when the conversation turns to theories of everything? Einstein sought in vain for a unified field theory that could reconcile general relativity with quantum mechanics. More recently, string theory is all the rage, but there are still loose ends. Torrance is after a grand or rather glorified field theory in which theology and science point together to a larger unitary intelligibility in which not string but offspring is the operative concept. The son begotten of the father, the offspring of Abraham, Galatians 3.16. All things in heaven and earth, the nature of deity and humanity, the future of the cosmos, all things are summed up in Christ. Christ is the ground and grammar of the shared intelligibility of theology and science. Let me finish by considering the role of human persons in theological science and scientific theology. Human beings are elements in the natural world. Man is a microcosm of the universe, homo microcosmos, a roughly six foot slice of the multiple levels that make up all of reality. But more than that, humanity is that unique place in the universe whereby the universe reaches knowledge of itself. Even more, humanity lives on the boundary between the physical and the spiritual at a level of reality which, like all levels, is open to something even higher, God, and ultimately inexplicable by levels below. So Torrance says, the universe through man at its highest and most advanced level is finally to be understood from its contingent relation to God. So thanks to humanity, the intelligibility of nature and the gospel of Jesus Christ has a voice. So Torrance describes human beings as priests of creation. I think he has a kindred spirit in Norman Wiersbe who says that we're in the midst of a crisis of seeing and that to see the world as God's creation, people must become creatures who live in Christ. Torrance's cataphysical poetics were perhaps made for such a time as this, inasmuch as he reminds us that creation isn't simply about origins, but about the present character of the world and our place in it. And ultimately, seeing the natural world for what it truly is demands more than theory. It demands cultivating an ethos, a form of life that sees and imagines and experiences the world as God's good creation. To live cataphysine along the grain of the created order, that's the way of wisdom that leads to human flourishing. It's a way that coheres with the way of Jesus Christ. Scientific theology and theological science alike are thus ultimately forms of discipleship, forms of listening for the Logos through whom and for whom all things were made, forms of following the Logos, uh, 
wherever he leads. Thank you. Um, so on the face of it, um, the theologian investigating the doctrine of, of creation and, and the natural scientist would seem to have the same object of investigation, but obviously their, their methodologies are very different. Um, in Torrance's estimation, is that because the ultimate object of the doctrine of creation is still God? Uh, first of all, uh, would you say that it was a good lecture again? Because I don't think the microphone was... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Great lecture, actually. <laughs> but just good. Uh, uh, so thanks, Will. T the fact is, I actually had a hard time finding lots that Torrance said about creation per se. I think the, but the main book is Divine and Contingent Order, I think. And in that case, it's still, he wants to say it's something about the physical world because science can't fully explain nature. There's something else that has to be said. Why is there something rather than nothing? So what what's, uh, theology allows us to speak to is the contingency of creation in all the senses that I mentioned. It's indirectly, yes, it's about God, but it's. I think he would say it's also about the world. It's a, that's why um, you know, science and theology don't have strictly speaking separated domains. There's an overlapping domain, and creation is that one. Steve. Thank you. Um, speaking of method, um, methodological naturalism is a principle that a lot of scientists follow, which you would not expect hmm. to, to find divine intervention in any natural process that a scientist would be exploring. Um, that, of course, is critiqued by intelligent design movement, it might be embraced by, say, the uh, evolutionary creation ap approach. I was at a, a conference this summer where uh, a, a speaker was talking about Torrance, and the speaker felt that in Torrance he, he found permission to for scientists, Christian scientists as well, to practice methodological naturalism. D would you um, agree that that might be something that would come out of his... Uh, his, his, his thinking about the practice of science? Well, I'd like to hear more about the reasons sure. for that. I'm, I'm a little yeah. bit surprised. I mean, first of all, is methodological naturalism a scientific idea, or is it more of a metaphysical presupposition? There you go. Yeah. So I'm a little yeah. bit surprised. I wouldn't have thought that Torrance would say that metaphysical naturalism is cataphysical. That is, it doesn't seem to be according to the nature of nature <laughs> as creation. So I, my, I'd, be, I'd be doubtful. I can't recall him mentioning it per se. Well, he, would, he didn't mention it, yeah. but inferred it from Okay. Oh. Thank you. Any other questions before we move to the panel? Uh, yes, Christoph. Thank you. That was a brilliant lecture indeed. Um, does Torrance try to say too much? Does he claim to know too much? According to some versions of doctrine, some things we see in the light of nature, others in the light of grace now, and others we have to wait for until the light of glory shines upon us. Um, is Torrance a premature theological realist? Well, you touch on something that concerns me, and that is the, the role of intellectual humility. Uh, it's the, uh, the comeback to John Hick, you know, that you have to repent. My question is, well, what if you have repented and you still disagree? <laughs> Do you have to go back, you know, and repent again? Because is there, he's, he is very confident and he's passionate. I think he's seen something that has excited him, and I think it's important to hear it. Is it premature to say that it's the end of the story? 
I mean, I, I'm more inclined to, uh, to listen to what someone tells me they've seen in reality than to go tell them to repent. But again, the magic eye picture, it, it is a, a compelling illustration because it's hard to deny once you've had the vision of that three-dimensional figure, it's hard to deny that you saw what you saw. Um, and yet, this is where I think biblical theology comes in handy. And so, yes, I think I, I would uh, want to agree that our eschatology is such that we're on the way still. We're not there. We may have the first fruits and a glimpse and an anticipation, but, but I would say that uh, our eschatology, as much as anything else, should give us pause and should cultivate a certain intellectual humility. Truth uh, is eschatological. Oh, that started some questions. Yes, it did. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Van Hooser. I enjoyed your talk. Um, you, you talked about how Torrance talks about the competency and the contingency of creation. Um, and you mentioned just briefly in your Schrodinger's cat <laughs> uh, analogy about, ah. about the uh, uh, sort of indeterminacy of things. How would maybe Torrance's ideas on this and the dualism relate to this idea that it's very prevalent these days of sort of, you know, as our observations go to the most basic level with quantum mechanics, there just seems to be no cause and effect, just indeterminacy. H yeah. How might that relate to well, it's what you've talked about? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that. Um, he didn't know about string theory, really. It was a little too late, you know, as far as the development. He did know a little bit about quantum mechanics, but there's not a, a, an in-depth engagement. But he does mention it sometime. And it, it, what he wants to say is, like the Big Bang, the singularity at the beginning, there are, there are limits uh, where he thinks that science just won't be able to see further. Maybe that's where the humility comes in. But interestingly enough, the book on Aquinas and modern science has a little section on quantum physics and says we actually need Aquinas' metaphysics there because once you abandon the concept of causality, then it really does become unintelligible. So he kind of defends the applicability of causality at the quantum level, even if we can't understand how it works. There has to be some cause, he is arguing metaphysically, for these things. Otherwise, nature does become to be unintelligible. But uh, Torrance wants to say that there's openness at the very, very beginning and at these very infinitesimal uh, subatomic levels where science doesn't know and that is an indication that they should be open. So our, our intuition should sort of guide us to assume that it's there even if we can't see it? Uh, so that's the Aquinas scholars line that we need as human beings we need to work with a concept of causality or otherwise our everyday experience becomes rather chaotic and unintelligible. And that was a little bit what was behind my question to Torrance of you know, what kind of authority these insights have and do they do justice to middle distance realism. So we have time for one more. Uh, Kevin Hector. Um, to add to the chorus, thank you very much for your paper. Um, so I liked the paper a lot and I loved the questions. The three questions I thought were brilliant and incisive. Um, I was curious about the answer to the th your solution, sort of, to the third one, right? So we, how do we adjudicate among competing claims to, well, this just stood out to me. One way to do this is to appeal to Catholicity, but that seems just to move the bump in the rug, right? Because then, how do you know what you're to take from seeing in Catholicity, right? Well. There are competing claims to what counts as Catholicity. There are competing claims to what one sees there. And so it seems as if you would have the conflict of interpretations all over again, right? So I'm just curious, um, in your estimation, where do you think this, this gets us, this uh, reality giving us the concepts the same way that the monkeys just sort of stand out to us? Is this a scalable model for how we are going to deal with reality? So again, uh, Torrance assumes a disclosure model, and then to the question, am I seeing the same thing, am I being disclosed to in the same way as someone else? He does appeal to Catholicity. He doesn't deal with the conflict of concepts about Catholicity. I think he takes it for granted that there is such a material content, 
the ecumenical councils. Again, he felt the pressure of disagreement on the doctrine of the Trinity, and he worked pretty hard to come up with a compromise on the filioque with Eastern Orthodox theologians, so much so that he was awarded a title. He has some, I wish I could remember what it was, but he has an official designation in the Orthodox Church, a kind of you know, medal of Orthodox valor <laughs> for going above and beyond the call of Trinitarian duty. Um, but I, I, I hear where you're going. It's the big question of criteria. You know, how do we know? How can we negotiate interpretive disagreements? I think Catholicity would be one, crit one criterion I would want in my arsenal. I understand it's not all sufficient. All right. Would you join me in thanking Dr. Van Hooser for his lecture? Uh, and yes, you stay. So I'd like to ask Dr. Long.